Paul Heston, thank you very much for coming on. A pleasure, man. Absolute pleasure. Good to, good to talk to you. For anybody listening, Paul Heston is a family man, a hairstylist, owner of two, almost three luxury salons in Dublin. And we are going to have a chat today about all things to do with Paul. So let's get straight into it. Um, Paul, looking at your arm right now, the tattoo. Oh, my arm. <laughs> That's yeah. a, a relatively new addition, about two years ago. It's about two, I've been two and a half, three years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk to me. I, why? Why the uh, tattoo? Why? Oh, I don't know. Look, the first one was that that star of David there, right? And I was mad into symbolism years and years ago. And I divorced. Oh, God. I am 14 years now divorced, right? And I've two little, I've two kids. What a way time. to get this started. Let's go. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Dear, listen, there's no messing with me. So I wanted to have a symbol of the kids because I only had them every second weekend and stuff. So I was reading this book about symbols and that, that the Star of David is the sign for man and woman. So I have a boy and a girl, so I didn't want to get their names on me. So I said, right, that it. And it took me this long to get the balls to get a bigger one. And I met this, a good mate of mine, Keith Duffy, actually told me about this brilliant artist in town. And I went in, I met this guy. He's in the ink factory. Went in there with him and yeah, two sittings later and a few Valium I may add and <laughs> I got this. I love it. Yeah, I love it. I want to add more, but you know, so 51. Sick. Yeah, <laughs> that's what, like, not judging in any way, but when no. I saw it, it was like, Jesus, you had like a bare arm, essentially. Like, you didn't look tattooed. No, and no. And one day it was like, whoa, okay. Yeah, I, I, a bit like that. It's either, it's either yeah, shit or get off the pot. I kind of I jump in. As much as I can, well, within reason, without being foolish, but I, I love it. Like, and it's people say to me, Oh, you, do you regret getting it done? No, man, it's, it's something I thought about for a very long time. And as you know yourself, you're sitting in someone's chair for four and a half hours and there's, they're needling you. And, you know, you do it. Is, no one, no one, if anyone says they don't feel it, they're, they're kind of lying. I, I felt that I was lepping. 100%. You know? 100%. Oh, and any, like, yeah. I've heard people saying they fall asleep and stuff. That doesn't happen. Not a chance. Uh, I popped two Valium going in, right? And even at that, I was like, oh, Jesus, Jesus. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but yeah, I love it. And yeah, it's funny you said that you were actually into uh, the symbolism. I just watched the Da Vinci Code for the first time, like two, three days ago. And the That's Sarah David. Yeah, 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 yeah. So were, like, were you actually like big into symbolism? Do you know what? That, that sort of sparked something in me to look at these things. Because stuff I love stuff that has meaning and it goes back a long, long way. Now, I wouldn't be sort of mad into it, but I just, it, I took an interest to it after that, after that movie, actually. And there's so much, the way that all the writing back in the, back years and years ago and how they wrote. Obviously, there was no writing, writing. They wrote in symbols. And it's, that just clicked my eye. And it was of the right time, if you know what I mean, that I sort of said, right, that's where I got it from. Deadly, I love it. Right, look, you said something there about uh, you're somebody that you either shit or get off the pot. Now you're a fa- you're a, a business owner of nearly three salons. Um, yeah. as far as I understand, it was it your dad that made Hessians. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. From going from just being a stylist to head first into two luxury salons, how did you go from A to B? Whoa, it was, it, listen, it, it was a bit of a mad one. From, from going from going to go to art college, going to NCAD, having a, a, I had a whole portfolio ready to go, to go into it. I just kind of, January of, of my leaving started, I kind of go, oh, this is not for me, man. If I go to college, I'm just going to become an absolute dipso and I'm not going to make any of myself. And my friend's mom back in the day said to me, look, ready-made business there. Your dad, you, you've been working there for all summer. So I just went up to him and said, look, dad, I'm going to, I want to come in and work. My mom started crying. She, was, she thought I was going to be, you know, into design, which I love design. And he said to me, right, this is a Friday night. And he said, right, you start tomorrow. And I said, oh, dad, give me the weekend off. And he says, no, if you're serious, you start tomorrow. And that was it. I just fell in absolute total head over heels about it. And I was very blessed that I got great training. He was very good to me, obviously. But, you know, I started at the... At no, I hate saying the bottom, but I started when you come in. I swept floors. I cleaned everything. I did as, as, as everyone would do, you know, because he treated me, obviously, as I would any of my kids, harder than anyone else to get me to where I wanted to be, you know, and where he wanted me to be, really. <laughs> and, from, and then... Go on, go on, go on. Yeah, but, and then, obviously, I went through the years, and I, I, I stayed with him, and, I, you know, from taking over from my dad, my mum died 19 years ago, and my dad just blew up. He said, look, I can't, I can't cope with this. 
because everything resembled my mom or represented my mom in the salon and clients and stuff. And he says, look, I'm going to go. So he went to they did a place in Spain and they went, oh, he went over to Spain and lived there. And I just basically took, took it over. And that was know? 19 years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was 2001. Yeah. So how did you take it from a, like a family run hairdresser to like top Dublin luxury brand? <sighs> Dad, Dad was... I kind of found it very hard to transition because he was so respected and he was so highly respected. And to this day, he still, he still is, in fairness. And um, I didn't know what to do. I was either going to piss it up against the wall or I was going to make something of myself and of it. So I just sort of knuckled down. I said, right, we're going to keep the brand. The brand is my dad. We got rid of the Frank part of it. So it would become Hessians rather than Paul or Frank or anyway, or my sister that was involved at the time. And we just sort of, I stuck to the core values of great team, fantastic hairdressing and an immaculate salon and I still keep those values today you know and, 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 all, and always training 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 myself and the team you know mm. but from, from we started off and dad left we had 12 staff in, in Drumcondra now we've got nearly I think 30 32 in Drumcondra now and then Clontarf we have 18 altogether. Wow. so yeah, uh, but listen, it wasn't like it was no rocket science here. Like, trust me, I, I just I grafted, I grafted hard. I got great people around me, and it's not Paul Hessian. It's 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 the it's the, t- the team. I know it sounds very sort of cliched, but I wouldn't be I wouldn't be able to do it without them. You know, there's not a chance in the world. Mm. And I have a brilliant general manager as well, like my sister's husband Liam, who takes a huge amount of the the pressure from me, which would be you know the 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 real day-to-day running of the business, the backroom stuff, which is, oh, most hairdressers would go, flipping heck. You know, there's VAT, you know, all the usual kind of stuff, all the, the paying stuff. I would just, I'd be losing the plot. I wouldn't be able for it. But he's fantastic in that respect for me, you know. So that, that's helped us grow. And obviously, like, your dad had built it to a 12-person salon and you took it from there. You have, you have to be a good leader to take it from 12 people to what, nearly plus 40 now at this stage? Yeah, yeah, we're up around 48. Um, do, do you know what it is though, Adam? I, 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 my mum always still told me, treat people like you like to be treated yourself. And that's what I do, and I've always done that. There's nothing I wouldn't do that I expect somebody else to do. I, wouldn't, I would stand on the bins, I'd pull the bins out, i clean toilets. Doesn't matter. You know, I, I always felt, and to this day, I teach my kids that and the kids in the salon. I call them my kids as well. I keep referring to them as my kids, all the trainees and stuff. But I will do as much with them as, as I expect them to do for us, you know. So, yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a leader to a point, but I'm also I'm, I'm, I'm knees deep with everybody. Nothing I wouldn't do. Okay. And so do you think that sets you apart or what do you think makes Hessians like... What's different from Hessians from any other luxury hair brand? I tell you, to be honest with you, we're grounded. I'm grounded. I have zero ego. I have absolutely, I'm the same as everybody else. And I don't believe in a famous hairdresser. I don't believe in fame. I think that's bullshit. I think we're all striving to be the best we can be. That's what I do. That's my team. That's what I want my team to be. And the name. Because my dad built the name of Hessians hairdressing. And I don't want that to go. But, you know, it's not about me. It's about that name, you know. But I'll drive that name forward with a team around me. But I don't do cockiness. I don't do prima donnas. And I certainly don't do fame. You're on telly, great. That's deadly. That's only to push the name of the brand, not to push the name of, of me, you know. And I've, I've refused an awful lot of, of TV work over the years. Now, not of late, obviously, but over the years. Just, just because I felt, oh, it's getting a bit tiresome, you know, all these makeover things. Jesus Christ, you're going to do so many makeovers. And then it just becomes the same, the same, the same, you know? Mm. And how do you, like, how do you go forward from here with that mentality? How do you go forward? There's so much more, I think, you know, it's, it's to build a brand, you know, it's, it's all about the brand. It's all about, but the brand is nothing without a team and the team is nothing without fantastic clients. So my, my, my philosophy is, Get your clients, keep your, cl- your clients, bums on seats, as in when they're in with you, it's all about the service. It's all about the quality of the work, quality of the salon from the minute they walk in to when they leave. And that's, that's how I perceive our brand, you know. And the, obviously it goes without saying, the hairdressing has to be impeccable, you know. The, the, the staff 
are so well trained from front of house to colorists to, to stylists to, to everyone to the trainees and I just feel that's that's how you do it it's 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 hairdressing right that's what we do and anyone that goes starts this highfalutin shite about it I don't go for that you know I really don't you know I love what I do I'm pa- I'm born a hairdresser and mm. I can I know what it's about because I I've done it from grassroots up and I love it but I don't like all the, the BS that goes with it, you know? I can, uh, I can agree with you there. I actually I just had Kai Wilson on like two or three oh, nights ago. Mm. Savage, but he's real like no bullshit hairdressing. None. None of that. And I, I know that guy. He's, I've, I've seen him since he started growing up. Because I'm, geez, I'm in this game. I'm 51 now at the end of the month. So I'm doing this since I'm 16. So I'm in it a long time. And I kind of I kind of know what's what's what. And I can, you know, I, but he's a sound guy. I've met him on some shoots in London from with, with L'Oreal. And that's that's great. You know, you're, you're pushing the brand of L'Oreal as well as your own brand. So it doesn't make you money, but it's good to do these things because I, I like to, to keep myself going. But now I start passing it on to other people. But that's why I'm, I, I came across Kai loads of times over there and sound. Really, really cracking hairdresser as well, you know. And he's a great guy. Yeah, yeah. Great yeah, guy. I see you got the you got the, the, the thing off from the buzzer yeah, thing. Yeah, I do. Oh, yeah, years ago. That's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. What an idea! Like I absolutely loved that, and I think I showed my mom that like two years ago. And like the nostalgia that it, I saw it bring her, I was like, that is like what a cool idea that like I can wear that, and the like the feeling that it can spark in somebody else from like a memory, like what a creative guy. Oh beyond it and yeah speaking of your mom she's a hairdresser as well isn't she so you're it's in your blood isn't it you see that's it's there is a difference you know i believe you know you can it's it's one of those things like you know you can either be i think family hairdressers are different than nowadays you know which there's not many of us there's and some amazing hairdressers don't come from family backgrounds that are just so passionate about what they do and they're phenomenal but when you, you when you've grown up in it in a household mm. I grew up in it. Like scissors, there was dolls' heads around our house. There was everything around our house growing up. It was mental, mm. you know? Oh, and, would you consider yourself a creative? I, I kind of, I, I feel I would be to a point. I wouldn't be as creative as I was years ago when I was younger, but I still have a creative mentality and I have a creative brain. But I, I kind of, I'm creating other stuff, if you know what I mean. I, I feel... I would feel, honestly, there's younger guys and girls out there that are more creative than me. And if I, 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 I couldn't keep up with them, on, to be honest with you. And I think I love seeing their creativity. And I admire it and I respect it. I don't have all that. I do have it to a point, but I, I can't push it out there. If I'm put in front of, you know, if I'm to do something for L'Oreal or Kevin Murphy or any of these guys that I, I work with, I can be creative that way. I can create haircuts, colors and stuff like that. I am, but when I see what's going on out there now, oh my God, there's some fantastically creative people out there. Absolutely fantastic, you know. But age brings you to sort of thinking and experience. Creativity is one thing. Does it make you money? Will you will you survive on it? Not necessarily. Not all the time. Some of them get little niches and go on it and then make a bomb. Like years ago, I wanted to do session styling and I did a lot of session styling for a long time in between work. Never made money on it. Mm. Never made money. Was I good enough? Yeah, I was good enough. But you just have to make the right break. Or you have to get, like, you see Sam McKnight, he's still doing it. He, you know, he's super, that guy. You know, there's not millions of Sam McKnight's. Michael Leon as well, fantastic guy. David Cashman, you know, um, Billy, what's it? Billy Orr as well. I'm not a genius at that kind of stuff. There's not, in Ireland, you wouldn't make millions of it. You know, that kind of way. Where, so I focused. When I knew what, my, I knew what I could do, I focus on that, and which is salon work, and that's what I am. I'm, I'm a salon hairdresser, really, really. On that point of like monetizing some type of creativity, what kind of advice would you give to somebody who is, say, looking at they know they're creative, like you did when you were younger, and they're like, "How am I going to turn this into a career?" The creativity part, or or, or, or to do salons, well. I never shatter anyone's dreams by, by saying, don't do it. Go for it and push yourself for as, for as long as you can. Work hard. Like, 
you know, you will not get anything sitting back. You've got to push yourself. You've got to be in the front all the time. Will money come? Sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. You've done front covers for, for, for donkeys and you get, don't get a penny on it. You get nothing. You get a credit and you're hoping something's going to come from that. You know, if you are creative, you, got, you can't, it's going to flow out of you somehow. So you have to let it happen. You have to let it happen. You know, you can't, you can't suppress that. Um, will you make loads of dough? If you're lucky, you will. You make a you make a living. Will you make for the rest of your life? I don't know, you know, but you can't stop creativity. That's why I believe, like, there are niches for everybody. It, but it wasn't for me. I wasn't. I knew what I wanted. I knew I wanted to have. I love the salon vibe. I love the salon environment. I love the pressure. And then sometimes if I get to do a shoot, I'm lucky enough to do something for L'Oreal or whoever the case may be. I like doing it, but you're, you're hanging around all day, you know? So it's, it's, it's a different mentality. It's a different feel for your head, you know? Mm. But if you're a creative man, you know, there's nothing's going to stop it. It's going to happen. It's going to, you're going to push it through. And you see it, I, I see it on Instagram. Now I'm not, a, I can, I'm, I, I navigate my way around Instagram. All right. And I'm not brilliant on it by any means, but the stuff on there, like people can push your creativity on, on Instagram and people are getting snapped up on Instagram. You see some people, doing very, very well on it. But then, on the other hand, <laughs> there's the Instagram famous, you know, yeah. where you do a lovely, beautiful wave and a beautiful sort of frame face and color and stuff. Bang, that's all you can do. You're a one-trick pony. And people are getting noticed not- 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 by that. But when they come in to do something for you, do me a little bob, do me a box bob, do, <laughs> you know, mm. they can't do it. So there's a lot of that. And... I think Instagram is brilliant, but it's also false to a point as well. Okay, okay. I I agree. I do agree. Mm. What do you think we've done better in the industry, just on that point? What can we done better in the industry? Do do, do you know, I think the industry as a whole is is what's happening. It's it's so varied, right? It's, It's, you've got, like, the industry is like how it explodes every now and again, right? There's a massive explosion of color over the last few years. And you got the likes of Sophia Hilton pushing all them, those crazy colors, which was brilliant for the time and really good and whatever. But does that happen in everyone's salon? No. Does it happen sometimes? Sometimes. Do I like it? And it's not an age thing? No, it's not my bag. It never was my bag, you know? But the industry is... It's, it's, you can see it now. It's coming back into a lot of precision haircuts. A lot of, you got the likes of Ben Brown and you got the likes of Andy Hensman from Rush, who is just phenomenal hairdresser, that guy. He's a beautiful haircutter. Absolutely stunning. This work is coming back. Now there's variations. You, you see, everything has to be diluted down to the salon floor. Everything has to be. So you see all this crazy stuff, this beautiful, real precision kind of work, whatever it is. And then you got to go, okay. How do I adapt that to my clients? And the, that's what you have to be able to differentiate between things, you know? And you got like Dove, Dove, Dove and Palmer, is it? I can never remember. I'm, yeah, it? yeah, the Dove and Palmer Co. or something. Yeah, I love their work. It's fantastic. And I worked with him in, in actual Zeba there a while. It was last year we did that. Wait, are you talking about Mazella and Palmer? Zell and Palmer. So that's yeah. A, yeah, it's, it's M and P now. Dove and uh, JB separate. So it was JB. Did he, did he, oh, he was. He's a fantastic hair cutter. But you have that. That doesn't work in the salon all the time. You take bits from that and you you interpret it and you put it into your own work. So, you know, Instagram is great for that because it's, it's giving two people ideas and and how to. Because in my day, the hairdresser journal was all we got, and that was every two weeks. You know, mm-hmm. and you sort of absorb it and you'd suck it in and. But now it's, it's, it's on your fingertips straight away, whatever you want to see. And that's how people, their creativity can be pushed in, in that way. But you know, there's only a certain amount you can do on the floor, I believe. Okay. No, I, I agree. I agree. Like, you're not getting Mary that comes in for a tint every four weeks, getting like balayage and waves all the time. You do. There is a time and a place. I 100%. You know, 100% there is. There's something, Paul, that I really respect for you. I'm mad into fitness, and you are somebody who is also into fitness. Like yeah. I said at the start of this, you're a family man, you're a stylist on the floor, you own nearly three salons. Like, I personally can't stand when people say they don't have time for fitness. Mm. 
There's always How time. do you have the energy to train for triathlons mm -hmm. while you do all this other stuff? I get up at 5 a.m. every morning <laughs> and I train. And I'm still doing it throughout lockdown. Both lockdowns, I'm up at 5 a.m. without fail. I don't, nothing changes. I keep the routine. Get up at 5 a.m., get myself ready. So I get my mind and my body ready to train. Um, I used to do weight training years ago, but I was breaking down. So I couldn't squat. I used to be able to squat off, whatever. But now I just, I'd hit the deck, you know, grab, I'd be on the ground. But So what I do is I get up at 5, get myself woken up, and I, start to, I stretch downstairs for about 15, 20 minutes on a roller, get my mind ready. And um, then I'd either run Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I, I normally swim in the pool. Now I've changed it around to it's a run time. So I, I build my runs up to a long run uh, on a Friday, which could be up to 15, 20 K. Then the other days are sort of intermittent training. Then on a Tuesday, I always try and get a swim in. And then I do a bike that evening. Then on a Thursday, swim again, no bike. Cause I saved the bike for a Saturday morning. I do a two, two and a half hour session on the bike in indoor bike. And, um, but see, I'm obsessive, man. I am like, I am a, I have, I have to, I have to keep myself going and doing things. Cause I, as look, as you said, a family man, I've got five kids. I can't leave Kira, my wife, to, to 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 do everything. You know, it wouldn't be right. But if I didn't do my 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 training in the morning, I wouldn't find the time later on because by by we get the kids sorted out, it's nine o'clock, and no one wants to go and run a ten fifteen k or run at five at nine o'clock at night or swim in the sea. You know what I mean, it's not it's not it's not right. You know. I couldn't agree with you more. And like, I also, I get up at five, I train. We've spoken at five o'clock in the morning yeah. a few times. Yeah. Um, I just, like, it's just something that I'm so hell bent about is that like those type of things, like having a business or dealing with family, like stuff that you don't want to do. Like no one wants, I don't want to get up at five o'clock every morning, but mm -hmm. like you do it. And then the next time something like difficult comes along in your day, you're like, I already got up at five. Like I might as well do this other difficult thing, and it's just a a snowball effect. Um, so so important to me for like people to get up and do stuff, and such a nice inspiration for people who think they don't have enough time. You have no time. You and make you it get it done. Yeah, you 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 personally. Like it's 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 phenomenal. Like I, it, even this morning now, it was it was a it was a run morning today, and it was. It was brilliant. Like, you know, it was a, it was a lovely run. The, 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 the air is different. The sounds are different. The feeling outside is different, you know. Tomorrow now we're doing, what day is tomorrow? Tomorrow's Thursday, am I right in saying that, yeah? Tomorrow's Thursday. Tomorrow's we're, we're meant to be doing um, a swim tomorrow. And I think high tide is, what time is high tide? 11 o'clock, but in the, in, the, in, like in the day, which is fine. I can get that in. So I'm going to do a bike tomorrow as well. But I'll do a swim tomorrow. And there's people there, this whole new craze. I don't know if you've seen it. There's people in the sea, man, and like, what are they on about? Like, what, what spiritual? I don't, listen, I'm spiritual. Yeah, I am, very. But when I sit there in my togs in the sea, just thinking it's cool because it's the new COVID thing to do, good luck to you. I'd rather swim 2K in the sea and get something out of it than sit there and freeze your nuts off yourself, you know? And it's, 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 it's bonkers. And I see the old guys down there and the, the older women, they've been doing it all their life. It's not just a fad. This swimming in the sea thing is a fad now for people. You know, it's, it, you know, it's great. The cold water genuinely is an amazing feeling. You know, I swim in a wetsuit. I wouldn't swim 2K without a wetsuit because I'd you, you, you get, get hypothermia, you know. Then I come out of the sea, take off the wetsuit. Then I do get in just to cool down because you're roasting. And it is a lovely feeling then. But, you know, I do it for those reasons, you know, and I do it. I do it, it like yourself, you, you obviously weight train. You should get it if you get in there in the cold after doing a big heavy session, man. All that magnesium gets into your body. It's it's a fab feeling, you know. I've is. tried to uh, so I've tried to get in a couple of times over the last three weeks. It's yeah. tough, like oh. fair play. I think the most I've done in the sea swimming like five minutes. I did there last week, and I yeah. mean that was like that was hell. No. Trust me, I look. It is still hell, but there is a way of getting your body and your. It's all about your breath. Look, I'm not lecturing, but it's all about your breathing. The minute you get in, you, you, you got like that, you know. You gotta just get your air. You gotta get the, the breathing right. And once you do that, like start getting. Like I love it, you know. I love to do it just just to shock myself and get myself back out, you know. And and you're okay after the swim, but it's it's from, it's it's an amazing feeling. 
It's yeah, the swimsuit's a bit of a, a bit of a hack as well. I get in and, in swim shorts, and that just takes it right out of you. <laughs> it does. It takes the sting out of you. I see it. It's, look, I, I'm just like even 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 to get into the sea at the moment. It's such a weird feeling getting in at this time of year because we're never normally sea swimming this late. It's coming into we're like nearly into December now, and it's kind of late for us to be gone. But we've no pool, so it's it's a sea, you know. But it's so amazing just being out there, and it's it's lovely being in the sea, right? And it's it's kind of darkish, you know. Even in the morning, the next it starts raining on you. <laughs> it's mental. I love it. <laughs> I love it. You sound like a nutcase right now. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, 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 well, I wouldn't say a nutcase. I used to be a nutcase. I used to be a bit of a headbanger, but uh, you know, this sort of stuff for me is total flip on the head. Like you know, the guys I train with. They've no idea about my previous life, you know. Yeah. My, like, you know, ah, we, like we train, we don't. It's very little booze and goes on. No booze in actual fact. So it's a different, totally different life. But it's I have to tell you, I really kind of gutted I never started this way before now, like because yeah. the competitiveness. I, I'm always competitive, but this is just phenomenal. Like I did a sea swim there about two months ago. It was a four kilometer sea swim, and there was 30, 30 people in it. And, oh, man, you should have seen me getting into it. I just, I don't know what happened. Something switched, and I went mad. And I was pulling people over the way, trying to get past them and get over them. And I was brilliant. It was just it was just great, you know. It was a great release, you know, to do that, you know. I love oh, yeah. it. How do you feel it's affected your, like, your everyday life now that you're training like this? I'm a, I, I'm a, I'm a calmer person. I don't fly off the handle as quickly as I used to years ago. I'm a lot. Now, I do listen to having now freak attack every now and again but it's more inward than it is outward and i've i have a lot more control over myself i think i control myself a lot more of a lot more awareness about myself i think a lot more would your staff agree with that 100 <laughs> percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah they do they all say sometimes some of them actually said the older crew that i've trained that i've trained them since they're kids and they're, they're still with us we keep our staff for for years. Like we've got Jesus, we've got staff that I trained with with us still. We've guys in 20, 30 years. But anyway, they, they said to me, "Oh my God! Like this happened years ago. You'd have killed someone." I says, "Yeah, but like you know, what's the point now? You know, I I talk to somebody different. I turn it around now. Obviously, we're not in the the, the age where you can give someone a serious bollocking because it just doesn't go down well. It's not right nowadays. But um, yeah, I have changed hugely. I've become a lot more." mellow <laughs> that's good to hear i actually really like what you just touched on there about what you said uh about it's not right anymore yeah for giving someone a bollocking what like do you think it's a good or a bad thing the way things have gone in terms of political correctness how do you feel about that this whole movement over the last kind of 20 years of political <sighs> correctness and how to speak to people and What's right and wrong? I'm being honest with you. I think it's I think it's bullshit, right? All this political correctness, right? I'm being honest with you. I think somebody a couple of years ago, I had a big ding dong with one of the staff. I was it was like if you have a bar, if I have a barney with somebody about something in the salon, it's done, it's there and done, it's over, it's finished. I do not continue it on. But anyway, she said to me, "I'm you're very passive aggressive." I says, "Listen to me for a second. I'm either fucking aggressive." Or I'm passive. What am I? Tell me, and I'll understand. You can't call me two things. I'm a bit bipolar most of the time, but just don't don't do this to me. And I just don't get that. There's too many labels on things. Look, we all have to be corrected, me included. We all have to have certain rules and regulate in the way things go. But at the moment, you can't say boo to a goose. You can't say to someone that's not politically correct. You're you're over, you'll be up in court like a shot. You cannot do that. You know, it just. And sometimes it's taken too far. Yes, there are limits that you should, and guidance you should adhere to, and how you speak to people. But sometimes I have to sort of, I have to blow the gasket. And I just feel, and it's not, I always say, it's not personal. This is not personal. This is directed at a situation that has happened, and it's being dealt with. You know, if I throw a wobbly and say, for fuck's sake, you have to do the blah, blah, blah. It's of the moment. And it's not a personal attack on you. So, you know, but... What's happening is there's this snowflake kind of kids out there now that the parents are compensating. This is, this are compensating 
and they're saying, oh, you're brilliant, Johnny, you're Mary, and you're fantastic, but this and that. That's not the way to raise a child. A child, our kids have to be taught, that's right, that's wrong there, Johnny. You can't do it like that, mate. Go back out and do it again. But no, I know, she, look, I'll fix it up for you. The mum or dad are doing And it's not right. You know, if you make a bag of something at home, for instance, my son, right, he's a, he's a dinger. Years ago, got him to clean the yard at the back of the house. And he does it. He's grand, his leaves bang into the bin. He comes in, I did a great job there, dad, didn't I? I said, Max, that's shite. But I, oh, I did my best. I said, that's not good enough. That, that's not your best. So I want it all gone. And that's only a tiny little thing. But parents, I believe nowadays, not everybody, are just saying, oh yeah, that's grand. But it's not. Because when he goes to work and he's asked to sweep up something in the place wherever he is, or, or he's asked to do something, filing, whatever the case may be. But it's, it's all right though, is it? No, it's not all right. It's not done 100%. There's not a 90%. 90% is not 100%. 100% is done properly. And it's done right. It's correct. You don't have to go back out and do it again. The Egypt was going mad. He was kicking bins and everything. I said to him, Max, kick a bin. It doesn't matter. There's still leaves behind it. So pull the <laughs> That's what's happening in, in, in the kids nowadays. I think you don't have to, you know, parenting is a, is a skill in itself. And it's, you're educating your children to when they go to work, when they become adults in, a, in, in our world, they can take correction. They can take it. That's not good enough. And People don't know what the word no means. Can I have holidays? No, you can't. But why not? I just said no. I didn't say it for the crack. I'm not saying it because you, you pissed me off the other day. I'm saying it no because Mary and whatever are, are on holidays that week. But can I not take them as well? Uh, they're not getting the no. And no comes from being at home and being taught by one's parents. No, I'm not. Jesus. <laughs> I'm not saying I'm, you know, the best parent out there or anything like it but I do believe parents aren't saying no to their kids anymore and sometimes I say yes to mine to keep them flipping out of my head and stop annoying me but no means no it doesn't mean maybe you know and we are you know. touching on good stuff here Paul um, <laughs> couldn't, couldn't agree with you more and whatever about this being like a relatively controversial topic like the idea of giving somebody like a fourth place trophy or telling somebody they did something right when they didn't or saying yeah when the answer is no like drives me insane now whatever it is probably to do with the way i was brought up and i'm not saying that it's the like best way or the right way but like yeah. i'm the, i'm the way i am because i was told no and if i didn't win it was because i wasn't like I wasn't the winner. I wasn't the best at doing it. Mm. And that's, in my opinion, the way it should be. You should be rewarded when you do stuff well. You should be rewarded when you win. But if you're not at the races or you don't do something correctly, like, you don't get anything for that. Well, there's no point. There is no point. And it's, it's not to say, yeah, and I do believe, okay, it, participation is massive. Yeah, participate. Do your best at the time. And if you don't win, great. Yeah, well, to a point. I'm a fuck. I have to win, but I don't always win. I have never won the L'Oreal Color Trophy in all the years I've done it, and it still kills me. It's oh man, it's. But anyway, I've, no, I've never. I haven't been good enough to win it. Simple. I have not been good enough to win it. There's an like. There's almost an art to being able to admit that and still keep doing it though, and that's that's the issue here. Really, is what we're talking about. Is that like, yeah, it's grand that you haven't won it, and like, yeah, whatever. But like being able to admit it and not like throw your toys out of the pram and be like, why am I not getting a participation medal? Like, oh, no, but I'm not good enough. Like I've never won it. So obviously there's people and a hundred percent there's people better than me. So, you know, and that's, that's life. Did I cry about it? Probably. Yeah. Went home and bawled my head in the car. And that's the truth, but you don't deserve it if you don't win it. And that's, that's, that's great. But I do think, and I'm not trying to stand on, my, you know, stand on a soapbox and say parents are teaching their kids on. No, but I do believe as you get older, regardless of your upbringing, you should understand right from wrong, yes from no, and then you're grand. And break your balls to be the best you can be. But never, never step on anybody else. Never do something wrong to anyone. Stick, stick on your path and on your journey and try to be the best you can be. 
and always never turn around and say, well, geez, I, I, I should have, I could have. If you can't, if you have to say that, then you haven't done it, you know? And that's, that's the way I kind of trying to teach my guys, my kids about it. I'm trying to, I, I'm still, still myself, I have to sort of every now and again say, look, yeah, step back there, mate, give somebody else a go. Certainly in the salon, if, I, if something comes in and I don't, I don't think, now of late, I've given, I've pushed all the guys, I don't take anything else anymore in the salon. I really don't. I don't do shoots only for L'Oreal if they specifically want me to do it. But other gigs, I, I pass on to the guys because I am not at the races when it comes to that. They're far better than I am, certain. With shoots, with sort of their creativity, definitely at the moment. You know, it's, it's, for, it's to broaden them, it's to give them, a, give them as well. But I'm old enough to do that now. I'm wise enough to do it. And I'm, and I'm do you know what? I think I'm, the word mature, I don't like, because, you know, that's, that is, I think I'm sort of, resp I respect myself enough to know that the guys in my place are better than me at certain things. But I can still cut a mean Bob. I'm still fucking tell you cutting Bob, so I'll stick to <laughs> <laughs> I love it. The confidence isn't gone anyway. The what? The confidence isn't gone anyway. Oh, no, listen, no, 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 no. I, I, I. My first bob took me nearly. David Marshall taught me how to cut my first bob. Four and a half hours, I think, of sitting on a stool cutting a bob with Kevin Hogan. Kevin Hogan, remember? Did you ever hear Kevin Hogan? Oh man, he owns a uh, company, company haircutters in Port Leash. Oh my God, he taught me in in um, in Marshalls. I, my dad would send me in there every Monday when I was training, and um, either David David started me off for a bit, and then then Kevin took over, and oh my Jesus. That man, savage hairdresser. Savage, savage, savage. Great I'll guy. To, I'll have to look him up. Oh, you will. The hurry used to, he had curly hair down to here, and the bastard made me dry, dry it every Monday morning. And then I had to smooth them <laughs> with those old straighteners that were like four degrees, and you'd be, Jesus, you'd be there for hours on it. But yeah, that was part of my training, all right? Paul, I have really, really enjoyed this conversation. We're going to wrap things up. And I started asking people this question at the end of every podcast. Yeah. And it's if you're on death row and you're yeah. about to get your final meal, what are you gonna eat? My final meal, what would I gonna eat? Holy jeez, I never thought of that before. Um what would I eat? Do you know what I actually would <laughs> this is as basic as be Jesus. I love a Sunday dinner, right? I make every Sunday, I make a Sunday dinner for my family here in the house. And it's one, one thing I do since, since, since I had a house and I, it's a family thing and I've been trying, trying to do it. I'll make a mean roast. So it'll, it'll be a roast. <laughs> and I love, I'm not going to, a curry and all that shit. No, no, I love curries. I love all of them. No, I think, I think an old beautiful Sunday roast, be it a roast. chicken roast or, or, or a big beef on the bone kind of roast. Yeah. Okay. A simple man. Potatoes. No, I'm simple. Oh, yeah. Mashed potatoes. Yeah, yeah I love mash. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, you see, you know what's going to happen now, right? I'm going to be thinking this all day. Oh, I could have picked a better fucking meal. I could have picked something better than this. I could have, <laughs> like, you know, that's going to wreck my head now. Everyone's going to know that I just pick a mash when I'm on death row. Yeah, mash. It, goes, it comes out easier, I'd say, when you're dying. <laughs> but then, then when you're dying, you don't care, eh? This is true. Paul. Thank you so much for the conversation. Thank you for being so open and honest. I really, really enjoyed it. I'm sure that anybody listening is going to get a lot out of this. So thanks, man. Have a great evening. See you later. Peace See you out. at five in the morning again. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I'll be on to you.